Let us pray. Gracious God, may this time together with you and one another be a time of prayer, not for what we think we want, but changed in ways we cannot imagine and be grateful for it. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today is the day we hear the ultimate love story. One might sense that there's nothing really new to share. Love is an old, old story. One that God has shared since way before the first Bible was written. And yet, love stories always present something new. They begin with the, let's begin with like the first mention of love in the Bible in Genesis chapter 22 verse 2 where God says to Abraham take your son your only son Isaac whom you love and the story continues as Isaac obeys God and offers his child as a burnt offering which by the way is not the horror story we tend to think it is it is, in fact, a truly sacred love story, though we usually skip over that one. The, commend, the commandment to love is first introduced in Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And the Israelites held the same commandment, sacred and as written in Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And if that sounds familiar, it certainly is. If you open the book of Common Prayer and turn to page 324, you will see what we are saying every Sunday at the 8 o'clock service. It's usually about 8.05 in the morning. And we pray. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I haven't even yet mentioned what's in the New Testament, which is, of course, where Jesus trains his disciples for frontline duty. Other top favorites include First Peter's assurance, love covers a multitude of sins. That's pretty helpful. And there is the best loved wedding scripture from First Corinthians. It makes some of us actually purr. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious, does not insist on its own way is not irritable, rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Certainly we wish that so. Perhaps questions to ask include, how does love begin? And is it possible for love to never begin? And if so, why not? Consider, for example, this church. I mean, do you walk through the red doors and poof, you know we are loved. While we do a good job at the welcoming in this church, experiencing love usually takes a bit more effort and attention. Love doesn't just happen, though that poof may seem real when a new baby is born into a family. And yet, after the parents experience the first bliss, there are those years of hard work to nurture and sustain the relationship and keep the love lively. After all, we humans can fall out of love just as quickly as we think we're falling in love. We are also capable of loving too much. I think, 
I used to get really worried about that. Now, I'm going to take you back a few years to my first home. And in our upstairs hallway, there was a niche. It was large enough to hold a statue that my mother happened to like very much. Yet on my first birthday, the statue was removed and adorable me was placed in the niche. And photos were taken to send all around the world to all my parents, friends, and other relatives. And while I was too young to really be embarrassed, the picture became a symbol of anxiety for me. Was I spoiled? Mm, probably. Was I to protect it? I think possibly so. My personal safety was a huge family emphasis. And at some point in my childhood, a teacher actually called me Cautious Annie. That, plus growing up when girls were secondary citizens, did nothing to encourage a bold spirit. How in the world I ended up in the theater is baffling. Don't say anything, Father John. <laughs> Perhaps my niche experience was more a product of my imagination. But unfortunately, others truly suffer from too much protection, and life becomes less about love and more about control. So the point is, it's complicated to love the lovable let alone to love those on the other side of the proverbial aisle. The world today seems to urge our rethinking. What does it mean to love? And how does love develop? How, or how does the flame get lit? And how do we keep it burning? The process is similar to that portrayed in Acts where the Jews, and who were the early Christians, lived a belief system that was quite different from their Gentile neighbors. The debate centered on table fellowship. The Jews maintained their dietary and circumcision beliefs. The Gentiles did not practice those disciplines. And therefore, the question burned could Jews and Gentiles eat at the same table? And if not, would that imply Jews thought themselves the only ones worthy of God's love? Well, now Peter, that faithful apostle and Jewish, he did an awful lot of listening. He listened carefully enough to hear the Spirit tell him to go be with the Gentiles and don't make a decision between them and us. After all, Scripture declared if God gave the Gentiles the same gift that God gave the Jews, who are we to hinder God? By the way, I just have to add something in here. At this point in the last time, 8 o'clock, this is when thunder really clapped. Wow! <laughs> so just kind of hear it. <laughs> Back to the story. Difference and lack of respect run rampant today, and I think God would agree with that. Perhaps at least some of that begins in our own backyards. I know a family that regularly debates whether or not it's right to invite a stranger, a day laborer even, to dinner at the end of a long day of hard work. Now the wife in that family has kept the food for dinner warm for hours while the work goes on. Quitting time has a long past. She says, well, why not everyone stop? And let, let's have dinner together. Her husband says, that's not proper. He's, he'd feel ill at ease. And that kind of begs the question as to who is feeling ill at ease. It's possible the hired help 
has no dinner waiting for his home, if he has a home. Or perhaps the situation is as simple as being hesitant to invite a stranger into the house as our guest. After all, we need to be careful in these perilous times. There's power in the invitation to dinner. And there's power when ordinary people listen to a stranger's story, when willingness to be bold is a daily event, as we witness in the Ukraine. It can change the world. Today's gospel magnifies the teaching we received in Acts. Judas has left the scene. The ultimate betrayal is near, and Jesus knows a final conversation with his disciples is urgent. So tenderly, he invites his little children to his side. Jesus knows he has one last moment, one last moment to be with his loved ones. Most of us have experienced that last visit. One last word to share, one last request, one last commandment, one last promise. What makes the love commandment new is not so much the topic, but the context, the timing. The suffering of Jesus is now. The plea that the disciples remain faithful is now. The commandment to love requires our attention now, even in the midst of our own dark night of whatever brokenness we each uniquely bear. And the promise of Jesus is renewed in every now moment, from Alpha to Omega, from the beginning to the end. I imagine we're feeling like we're more back at Good Friday rather than feasting in Eastertide. But isn't that true of everyday life? The truth beckons hope, and love wins as long as we insist on loving, no matter the cost, no matter the day, no matter how young or old or busy we are. That's what is meant when we describe faith as laying down one's life, which has us dare to believe that even in God's silence, there is God's nearness and to be courageous enough to give of ourselves to the little part of God's world in which we reside and with whom we reside. I mean, even a simple hello to the passerby can put new life in someone's footsteps. My last words for this day I quote from a good friend's gratitude list that she does every day. And perhaps you will agree with me, I think she honors the holiness of life on life's terms. So here it is. I am grateful for a lively sense of hope. No matter what doom anybody is predicting, no matter how dark things are. Love leads our way down the road that takes us way farther ahead. That finds me unwilling to accept the present trauma as a final word in a post-Easter world. All shall be well even if it isn't.